Hello, everyone. Welcome to week three of the Introduction to Machine Learning webinar series. Thank you for joining. I am Joseph Itopa, and I will be leading today's session on outlier detection. I am excited to introduce you all to some new concepts over the next two hours. But before we begin, there are some announcements I'd like to make. Um, First and foremost, a huge shout out to our amazing team of volunteers for putting together this series. We would, love, we would not have the series without them. All of them are present as panelists. Without them, we will not be here on this webinar. I am Joseph Topa, an ML engineer at Omdina and RA365. For this session, Rosifa Singh and I will be the speakers and all other leaders will be present on the chat to support you. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions you have. Secondly, we would like to talk, we would like to thank our sponsor, Home Depot, for putting together much needed events for our community. Do show your appreciation for them by retweeting our post. Elena will be sharing them on the chat. We are in week three of the series and here is what we have in store for the upcoming sessions. It is a single registration link for all the sessions. So if you are on this webinar, you have registered for the sessions already. A round of, um, of housekeeping before we kick start today's session. You can download the slides for today's session at this URL over here. Um, one of our panelists will share this information in the chat. Feel free to download and follow along. Two, if you have any questions regarding today's session, post them in the QA box so that, um, so that one of our experienced panelists can answer them during the session. If you are facing any issue during the webinar, do chat directly with the panelists so one of us can help you out. Finally, don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and join our Slack channel one of our panelists will share the information in the chat. One of my favorite quotes before we begin um, is, if you torture the data enough, it will confess to anything. This quote is given to us by Ronald Coase. And the lovely part of it is that in data science or machine learning, learning, most of the things we do is all about torturing data. It may sound weird and you won't love to hear that to some extent, but believe me, when you manipulate data, when you try to remove features you don't want, or you use features to generate other new features, what you are basically doing is torturing the data. So in order to um, get the best out of it, to suit artists, and then you may say, how does this relate to outlier detection? Will we talk more about it? Yes, we have to detect outliers. Yes, we have to find a way to manipulate outliers, remove them or handle them, reduce their dimensionality, such that it helps our model to perform better. Such doing is a torture. Yeah, data may not be able to confess that, okay, you are torturing them, but, um, we, we intend to torture the data actually no practically that's what we are doing. So um, we'll go to the next slide. Our agenda for today, number one, what are outliers, type of outliers, 
of course, we want to know the definition of outliers because I remember the first time I heard of outliers. I'm like, okay, um, should I check my dictionary or should I ask Google? Which should I do? And which should be the best option for me? But I couldn't really say. So I had to ask a fellow colleague and he was like, okay, an outlier is this, is that. I said, oh, that's cool. That would have been maybe, maybe better than what dictionary would have given to me because he gave lots of examples in order to put me through. But then, when we understand what outliers are, we also want to know the types of outliers. Are there categories of outliers? Or are, are they all just uniform? Of which, in most cases, you can't have things like this being uniform or true. You definitely have categories. So we will look at that. And of course, the causes of outlier, how the outlier became or came into existence. What is the genesis? What brought them into existence? Because if we understand how they are introduced, maybe, just maybe, sometimes we can prevent them from happening or we can find a way of um, handling them whenever they happen to occur in our data set. Um, of course, we also want to understand the impact of outliers on data. If you do not know the impact of a particular thing, you will not take it serious. So, um, for instance, let's say you have, um, we are told about cancer, how deadly cancer is, and we have seen the impact of cancer on lives. And we are like, okay, we have to be, we have to tread carefully because this is cancer. The same with outliers. We want to understand, okay. Once we get the point of what outliers are, I want to know the impact. How is it damaging? Does it have posit positive impact or negative impact? By the time we understand this, I think it will help us in making better decisions. Um, of course, we we'll also talk about ways of detecting and fixing outliers, which is very, very important. It's the center of the whole discussion. And um, other ways of manipulating outliers is also very important. We'll talk about that today. Then um, some references and assignments. Yeah, we need to keep the knowledge. And um, in order to keep the knowledge, we have to practice. So in order to aid your practice, we give you some references to go through and assignment for you to um, practice with. And of course, Rishika will um, definitely take you on Google Collab on the implementation of, um, of um, how we can detect outliers and fix outliers. So she will um, show you some examples on notebook or an example on notebook for you to get grip of what we're talking about theoretically. So what are outliers? First, um, I will give an instance to this. If you, if you happen to um, maybe attend a public school and you, you, you definitely know how students hang around and then um, not in all countries though, some specific countries from my experience. Students, there's the times when lecture is ongoing and maybe one or two students don't choose not to be in the class. They just choose to stand outside the class. Um, this is just a literal example for you to get the point. You see, you have so many students in the class listening to the lecturer and you just have one or two students who choose not to give concern about the lecture. In such a situation, you realize that, okay, such students have this, may be a distraction to other students and we can tag such students standing outside while others are receiving lecture inside the class. We tag such students as an outlier. Um, a more detailed example here is um, the Gaussian distribution you see by the left of the screen. The foot of the Gaussian distribution are also data points, but those data points are not at the region of interest or area of interest. You can see the, um, the centroid of this chart and you have the data distributed along the, um, the horizontal axis. But most of the data points are at the centroid. Those that spread away at the foot of this um, Gaussian distribution are outliers. They have 
dimension way higher from the um, center of interest or region of interest. Let's take a look at another example for you to get what we are trying to explain. I think it will be more helpful. Here we have um, some charts, two of them, and I will describe them one after the other. The first one is um, figure 2A. You have some data points, the star data point, red stars, and one of the data points happens to stay far away from the others. Such is an outlier. And if you also have a regression model that you built, and after building the model, you saw how the um, data point spread along the line of best fit. Those, the, what is our concern every time we're building um, a model, most especially a regression model, you see that is the data point that we are concerned about how close are they to the line of best fit. So those that decide to spread far away are outliers such as this and then um, that. They are outliers and you start thinking, how do we handle this? Because this will not help the performance of the model. How do we make sure that, okay, such thing can be produced or um, properly managed? Meanwhile, um, at this stage, you know what outliers are. And when you look at them, when you look at the chart, you definitely, you'll be able to spot an outlier. In this example, again, before I go further, I will give you an instance of cow. We all know cows um, is an animal with four legs. In a situation where you have like maybe 10 of them all in white colors, and you have a particular cow which is black in color and decide to stay far away from where the 10 cows which are white in color, where they are feeding on the field. The black one which is staying far away, literally for a layman, that is an outlier. So we need to understand, okay, why is this guy, this black cow not staying with the um, 10 white cows? So will it affect the, the, the Hesman who is trying to control the cows, of course it will affect him. He will find it difficult to control the cows. In this case, the head, the Hesman is um, the data scientist or um, machine learning engineer and the cows here are the data points that we intend to handle. I hope this explains um, it better. So we can still take it further look, outliers don't just, um, they occur in a series of data points, both in structured data and unstructured data. So um, when we say structured data, we're talking about numbers um, for regressors and the like, and we talk about unstructured data like um, text, images, of course, outliers, of course, they are so. So um, in cluster data, you see that those, for, for the first example, um, figure 3A, which is by the left side of the screen. The white ones, the white um, data points are the inliers and outside of it, you find the black data points, which are the outliers. Those outliers after clustering, um, those data points that choose to stay out of the cluster are the outliers. And why did they choose to do so? We will discover that as we um, move forward. Of course, in time series data, outliers also happens to be present. Um, you can see uh, a spike at this point, a data point shooting, moving away from um, the rest of the data point at just a point here. And this can be regarded as an outlier as well. We'll talk more about um, outliers in time series later on. So, um, okay, now we want to take a look at the causes of outliers or the genesis of outliers. How did outliers come into existence? What gave birth to outliers? We are concerned about that. First is error in data entry or human errors. Sometimes we do 
while collecting data, um, there are two forms of data collection first. That's what you need to understand. We have primary data collection and we have secondary data collection. The primary data collection is the one you collect raw on the field by yourself. Now the secondary data collection is the one you collected from a third party. You were not there when they were collecting. You do not know the process of collecting it. Like most of the data you found online, um, you just use them. You, you don't know how it was collected. You don't know the processes, the pre-processing of the data. You have no idea. Now this tendency, it comes with an error. So that is one way an outlier can come into existence. And if you do it yourself, maybe just maybe you may escape the error but on the other hand sometimes you cannot you can also introduce an error um, as far as you are human you are prone to to make mistakes so we can introduce an error in the data sets and the moment we do that we are definitely giving birth to an outlier in the data set then um, we have errors during measurement which is the instrument errors as those who um, have idea about electronic systems, they will understand what I mean at this stage by instrument errors. And then what it actually meant, let me explain, is that when we have um, electro an electronic equipment, that is to take a measurement, and the electronic equipment has some level of accuracy. So the error the electronic equipment introduced into the measurement is an instrument error. Uh, you will say, why can't an electronic equipment give you a perfect um, measurement? Why is it giving you, um, why is it introducing an error into the data set or into the measurement? The reason behind that is that it's an electronic equipment and there are level of tolerance for the electronic components. So the tolerance level is what actually causes the electronic equipment to have some level of accuracy, thereby introducing an error. Take for instance, a temperature um, um, data collection device to take your temperature. Um, there's the tendency that there will be an error. If you take a look at the um, temperature monitoring device for, for COVID-19, um, you will see that whenever they point it to your head, you have maybe 36 degree, 35 degree, 35.5 degrees, and you're wondering, well, okay, this is perfect. It may not be perfect the moment they decide to extend the decimal points to up to maybe five decimal points, and you have two of those devices taking the measurement, the readings will be different. Now, those difference in the reading is the error we are talking about and it's introduced by the device, not the person pointing the device at you. Yeah, thank you. So um, we have the experimental errors, which is um, during data extraction or experiment planning and execution. This has um, a lot of relationship with the errors in data entry. Experimental error is actually, it involves maybe human or machine trying to extract data at a point. At the point of extracting the data, there's um, the process of extracting the data can introduce an error into the data sets. Then we have dummy outliers. This is intentionally created to test um, modules So yeah basically models, while building models, we introduce an outlier in it and we want to note the performance of the model. Will it be good? Will it be bad? Will, be, will the model be able to handle such level of um, outliers in the data set? So, and um, we also have the data processing error, which of course, we at a stage you we are trying to manipulate the data set possibly during feature engineering and while doing that maybe you just use a basic if statement to perform your feature engineering and during the use of the if statements you just did um okay within such category and that category uh, maybe you said okay between 10 and 15 that is um number values here 
or numerical values. Between 10 and 15, you want that to, you want to create a new feature. Between um, um, 16 and 20, you want to create a new feature. If you are not very careful, maybe there may be a data um, point of 15.5, and already you've ignored that 15.5, and that can start introducing some errors into the data sets that you are not aware of. Um, we also have the sampling errors or extracting or mixing from wrong or various sources. Uh, this is actually um, very rampant in signal processing, of course, or during um, data wrangling, where you intend to bring two or more data um, features together. I, I am very, very cautious of this stage of, you know, people can say, oh, I can just use one line of Python code and I'll make two data sets. I'm like, are you really sure what you're making? You have to be careful. Merging the data set is not a problem. Are you merging it rightly? That is the issue because you may make them wrongly and then the next person you submit the data set to have no idea what you've done. And then the person just keeps saying, oh, I don't know why my model is not performing better. And also, other times it can also be maybe like during signal processing where you want to convert an analog signal to a digital signal. And during the process of doing that, you have to sample the amplitude of the signal. And you just did some of those little manipulations by converting the analog signal, which is your sine wave, to digital signal, which is maybe possibly your square waves. You will definitely chop off some part of those um, um, signal level. And while doing that, you can introduce an error, of course. It's very possible. So, that is that for sampling errors. We also have the natural error, of course, when we talk about um, events or things happening in life, you can see there's natural events and there is um, artificial events. Natural events happens to be things that come into existence on their own. Um, for instance, maybe an earthquake um, because of your, your position on the um, on the globe, you, you are not really concerned much. Maybe at other places, they'll find it difficult as well because of their position as well. And they start experiencing it quick. It's not because um, they have money or because they don't have money. No, it's just their location on the globe that actually um, help them to face such earthquakes. So those are natural phenomena. But when you now see a house caught fire, uh, that is different. House can caught fire anywhere, anytime. So you won't call that a natural phenomenon. Then coming back to data, you said, how does that concern data? And how does that concern an outlier? Of course, it has a lot to do with that. There's tendency we have um, a natural error. But in most cases, some people say, oh, it's not really, it's not an error, but they do exist. Um, you are just there putting those data together and you just notice that there's this particular data point that has a very high value and you decide to track it back to the maybe, maybe luckily enough you were the one that did the data collection and you track it back to the inception or the beginning and you realize that, okay, that was what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. So um, you don't want to manipulate data anyhow because you have to answer to that. So, um, we'll, talk, we'll go to the next thing. Well, before I go, uh, I will also tell you that, okay, what are the type of outliers? We have to consider the type of outliers. Now we've considered the genesis of outliers, the causes of outliers. Let's take time and consider, are there categories of outliers? And if there are categories of outliers, how do we differentiate them? How do we know outlier A from outlier B by looking at them and how do we intend to even detect them. So if we know the category, by the time we detect them, we'll be able to say, okay, this outlier belongs to that category and this is the best method to handle such outlier. Then we have, um, we are going to look at basically six types of outlier. We have the univariate outlier, the multivariate outliers, the point or global outliers, the collective outliers, 
contextual outliers and of course other outliers which will not go in detail which is um, additive outlier and innovative outlier mostly they have their area of um, interest let me put it that way innovative and additive outlier happens to always occur in time series data sets so we'll take a look at that now we'll take a look at um, univariate outliers when you have these data points staying far away from the other data points in a single feature space that is a univariate outlier when there's a single feature um i will make it very clear at this point you need to understand something when you have um, some data sets imagine an excel notebook in your in your mind in an excel notebook each of those columns are feature space then each row is a class do not forget this in case i decide to uh, mention them i don't want you to be confused about it so you can see that the chart here you have a feature that is plot it's a single feature heart rate and it was plotted and you have a particular data point staying around i think the value of that data point should be 150 in value so you have it staying there that is an example of outlier and you say how will i just call it an outlier just because the value is around 150. of course you have to consider um, the value of the rest of the data sets, which I will show you. Um, if you look at this point, you can see that the data set is spread around 60 and 100. Anything outside of this has a different dimension in space. Such is an outlier and we have to find a way to practically handle it. So we'll take a look at multivariate outlier. Um, when we have n feature space in this case um, we have more than one feature and then you have outliers dancing around um, you definitely want to consider what type of outlier is this can this be univariate or multivariate or due to the, no um, the number of features you will classify it as multivariate you can see that we have an outlier here we have two feature space, recurrent length and then uh, linear length. So at this space, you have an outlier here and you have another one there. Yes, you can also categorize this as an outlier. Why? Why will you do that? You have to consider the dimensionality of the data sets. And if you consider the dimensionality of the data sets, you realize that, oh, is it really an outlier? This data set, where are they spread? around you have to consider the points from eight um, and maybe 16 or so and you have to also consider the data set on the horizontal axis how are they spread is it from 70 to 110 so by considering these two features you'll be able to now decide if this is actually an outlier or not but then if you take a look at the red data points you see that this guy is standing far away from the rest and is founding itself in an entirely new data set that is an outlier but here it's not the case it was it's still around the um the data points the um uniform data points or the data points of each type however the dimension is actually quite far from the main data points. So we consider this also as an outlier. Then we have point outliers. And um, for point outliers, you may start thinking, what is the difference between univariate outliers and point or global outliers? The difference is not quite much, but it's very clear. How? You take a look at the feature space here you have two features and then you have this data point standing away that is an example of a um, point outlier but for um for univariate permit me to take you back for univariate you have this feature it's only a single feature and then you have the 
outlier over there. But when you come to um, points or global outlier, the case remains different. You have two features and then you have an outlier standing away. So and um, we are very cautious of the distance of the of the data point we are considering as an outlier. We are very, very cautious of the distance of that data point from the rest of the data point. Um, that's what helps us to decide if it's an outlier or not. So we also talk about collective outliers. Yes, um, we have talked more about outliers and we are also, we have been considering the fact that, okay, outliers are just those data points that stay away from the rest and just decide to be maybe possibly the prodigal son or the prodigal child. But when it comes to time series data, it seems to be a little bit different. You just have these particular data points in a time series data that decide to have uniform, um, will I call it behavior or nature from the rest of the data. And in that case, you call them an outlier. That is not enough. Why do we say that they have uniform feature? I will take, um, I'll give you an example. If you look at this red um, spot on the chart, it has an amplitude around, um, I don't know what the value is, but it maintains a consistent uniform amplitude from 0.1000 to around um, to close to 1500. This can be regarded as an outlier because the rest or the main data points have the amplitude from around minus 4.5 to minus 7. And this guy decides to have an amplitude way different. So this is an outlier. And you start considering how do we handle it? We have known so much about outliers. At this stage, I think we should be handling outliers. Oh, at this stage, you want to see Rishika um, using the sword to tear outliers apart. Actually, we still have to take more look about other categories that are definitely um, possible. So we take a look at the contextual outliers. Here, the data point is considered a contextual outlier if its value significantly deviates from the rest of the data point in the same context. If you look at the definition, it revolves around the idea we have been explaining earlier. There's nothing different from all we have been explaining. But then we are saying, how do you identify this? If you look at those da these um, data points, we have these four data points here they all exist around six. And the rest of the data point happens to be there and over there. So these guys are considered an outlier, but then they are con considered an outlier, not just an outlier, but conditional outliers. And you said, um, why is it conditional? Because something triggers them to come into existence around at that point. So you can notice that. Then there is other outlier here that you also notice. Um, this guy decided to stay way off point from the rest. It's a spike. And you want to say, okay, can we also consider that as an outlier? Yes, it's an outlier. In fact, this is the one we are more conversant with. Well, however, we have to also take a look at the other ones that happens to occur at a time we do not expect. So, um, and when they come into um, occurrence, we know we never expect an amplitude of around six. Those data points that decide to come into that point, okay, we have to consider them an outlier. Whenever you are collecting data, there are other things you also have to put into consideration. You have to know um, you have, you need to have specification. You need to be able to say, okay, the data we are collecting, uh, we are collecting, okay, for instance, we are collecting human temperature data. And we know that the human temperature should exist between certain range. So if you have a, date, um, a temperature way above 36 degree or way below 36 degree, maybe around two degrees or three degrees, you start thinking, okay, something is not right, okay? But if the human being seems to be okay, and other tests are performed and the human being seems to be all right at such temperature, 
you, you, you have to record it. You can't ignore such data, but also it becomes an outlier in your data set. So you have to start thinking, how do you handle such? So it's very possible to have contextual or conditional outlier to come into existence. Then um, we have other outliers that also occurs in time series um, data. The first one is the additive outlier. And this is actually very easy or simple to understand why. An additive outlier occurs at time t if the underlying process is altered or perturbed additively at time t. Um, possibly you were having this recording at some point, this um, data recording at some point, and all of a sudden you notice um, this downward spike. This is an example of additive outlier. Why is it additive outlier? It's because it becomes part of the data as you keep recording, but it doesn't change the situation of the, um, of the recording you're doing. As you can see, this seems to be progressive um, curve. It keeps rising. And then when the outlier occurs, it didn't stop. It didn't change the situation of the um, curve it kept rising. So this is an example of an additive outlier. Then um, we take a look at innovative outlier. The only problem with innovative outlier is that when, it alt when there is an alteration in the data you are collecting, it happens to change other observations. Um, in this case, what I mean by observation, each of this collection that you can see as a curve is an observation. So when there is an alteration, which is um, an error, it is regarded as innovation because the reason why it's called innovation is that it changes the situation of the curve as it progresses forward. Unlike what you have here, that it only changes the situation once and it stopped and the curve continues in the right path. Here, you don't have that. It changes the situation of the curve as it moves or as it progresses forward. So that's why it's called innovative. Um, and of course, you may be thinking, how do you handle an innovative outlier? If this happens, what are you going to do? We always have ways of handling problems. That is one of the things that makes us human. We find ways to solve problems. So we'll talk more about that. So let's um, have a little fun. I hope um, you guys have had some understanding about outliers, what they are, the causes of outliers, and of course, the types of outliers that we have. Here, what I intend to, we intend to have a little play to see if you have the idea of what we've been talking about so far. The question is, which of the following is not a type of outlier? One, we have multivariate outlier, Two, we have global outlier. Three, we have angular outlier. And four, contextual outlier. Drop your choice of answer in the chat section. Let's interact. That is what it is all about. The knowledge we're sharing, we are not just giving it to you. No, we are saying, let us pass it around. Let everyone get involved. Let everyone know what we are talking about. So that at the end of the day, we all understand what we are doing, all right? to keep us engaged. Thank you. So, um, we'll be talking about outliers as a tsunami in data. Wow, do outliers actually have such power? I think they do. If they don't, we won't be talking about it now. They are very important. They have a um, very strong influence. So, um, the impact of outliers cannot be overemphasized. Outliers is able to rapidly change the result of data analysis and modeling. It increases the error variance and reduces the power of um, statistical um, analysis. If the outliers are non-randomly distributed, they can decrease the they can decrease the normal normalities of the data they can bias or influence estimates that can be substantive interest. 
for all this, I don't want to just read it out to you or just talk about it. I want to explain it further for you to get the concept here. For instance, we have these um, digits. And I think um, the total number of digits we have here is, um, we have 11 digits on the left. That's without an outlier. When we take the mean, the mean is actually the addition of those um, 11 digits divided by 11 as a value, and you have the mean. The median is actually the number at the middle, which is five here. And then the mode, the one that we call most frequently, which is five. Then we take the standard deviation of us with some mathematical formulas. Then we want to know how does this have impact in what we are talking about? Um, let's introduce an outlier. We have have the number with value 300. So we take the mean. The mean is now 30. When you take the mean, um, what we do is we now have 12 numbers. So we add the 12 together and divide it by 12. We add the 12 numbers together, divide it by 12, we get the mean. The same with the median, we just look for the one at the middle. Oh, it happens to be five and six. We don't really have a middle number. So we add this five and six together, and then um, we add them together, then divided by two, we have 5.5. And we take the mode. The mode remains the same, which is the most frequent. But the standard deviation is massive. We have 85.03 compared to 1.04. That is how. Um, outliers can be very dangerous. Let me put it that way. So you now be thinking, if we have such things, what do we do? How do we handle it? Yes, we have ways of handling those data. Um, we have ways of handling outliers. So we're going to talk about it. Um, again, this is another example. Um, a second for me to explain this better to you. It can also be in our model. Before we just have numbers to describe this, which is fine. We all get the point. But when we take it further practically to our model, what happens? We realize that when we have outliers in our data set, you can see the line of best fit starts misbehaving. Why is the line of best fit misbehaving? Um, do, we, do we report the case to a police station? or something. No, 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 no. We, can't, we can't do that. We have to come and solve this problem in a diplomatic way. You understand? We have to solve it in a diplomatic manner. And to do that, we have to take a look. What is the problem? And we realize that there are outliers here. So when we take off this outlier, what happens? You can see the performance of the model. It becomes better. It becomes, um, the performance improves without outlier. So that is how impactful an, an outlier is. Um, okay, now let's play around a little because um, we'll, we'll have to do this to keep ourselves engaged. So some data scientists argued outliers can be used in a positive way for improving model performance while others disagree. What is your take on the argument? Agree? Disagree? Of course, it's your choice. You have to let us know. We can't really say for now. So, um, so far from all you've learned, outliers, are they um, beautiful? Are they having positive impact or they have negative impact or influence on the data set? You have to say it because if you are here, we assume you are one of those scientists right now. Of course, we are all data scientists. so. It's time for us to come together and say, okay, this is the answer to this, okay? And do not be scared of saying your answer may be wrong. Please feel free, feel comfortable, put the answer in the chat box. If it is wrong, you learn from others. If it is right, you clap for yourself and take a deep breath and say, wow, I'm so good. Thank you. So let's look at the next um, slide. Okay. Um, this slide happens to have a kind of um, 
We are going to take a tea break. I will not tell you what I've seen, but I hope you didn't see it. But if you do see it, congratulations to you because I don't know. These are the things that give people bonus in classes. But the question here is um, you have some data sets and you are building a model to classify the data set. You observe that your classification model has three ways to accomplish this. Choose between one, two, and three, the line of best fit that can best classify your data. Take notes of the outlier in the data set. Drop your selected number on the chat box. Please do that and then um, we can just take 30 seconds um, and of course to drink water or take some tea. Thank you. Okay, um, some, um, there's a question from Davy. Maybe I should answer it before I continue with this um, tea break. He said, given a raw data set, is there a formal way to detect the types of outliers mentioned so far? Um, one of the easiest way of doing this is through visualization, but we are going to talk more about how we can detect those outliers and of course, possible ways of, um, of um, handling them. So we have other ways of detecting outliers apart from visualization. So we're going to discuss them. Thank you. Now we can go back to our, I believe you have taken a moment to maybe drink water or take tea. Um, thank you for doing that alone without inviting me. That seems to be very unselfish. So let's go to the next slide. So detecting and fixing outliers. So we have ways or methods of doing this. Um, one of the common ways as um, pointed out by Davy in his or her question, is visualization. That is one of the easiest way of detecting outliers. And you can do this through box plot, histogram, or scatter plot just to identify the outliers. But then we can take further. We can decide to use multivariate detection or dimensionality reduction. Those are the two major ways of handling or detecting outliers in a data set. So, We are going to take a look at that. Um, the first one is the multivariate detection. And um, we can do this with the aid of Mahalanobis distance or Cox distance. And you may be saying, why are we mentioning distance everywhere? As I said earlier, most of the outliers you see even if you're using visualization or any other method, one of the basic thing you use to identify them is the distance from the um, rest of the data set. You see a particular data point staying far away from the um, main data sets or the data sets at the area of interest. So data points are classified as um, an outlier. So in addition to this, we can also see that, okay, um, we don't just want to look at it and say, wow, that's an outlier, we can see you. No, we want to be able to mathematically handle it. We want to be able to um, handle it with our um, codes and be able to, okay, point out, detect it from our codes mathematically, not, not visualization this time, and be able to, after detecting it, finding ways to handle it properly. Now, what Mahalanobis distance actually does is this. It tries to calculate the um, outlier or the data points, which is regarded as an outlier from the centroid of the data points. If you look at this um, histogram, 
the centroid is around here, which is around um, four, the band four. And then by the time you use your um, implementation, mathematical implementation in Python or R or whichever language to identify or to calculate the distance of the outliers from this centroid, we can be able to say, okay, the data points around 20 and 25 are outliers, while those around 10 and 15 are not outliers. And this can also be shown on the um, image by the right. What you have there is also another example. You can see a cycle um, circulating the data points. This is an example of Malinobi's distance. We have the centroid around here, and from the centroid, the distance to each data point is calculated, and those far away from the centroid are regarded as the outliers. Um, we'll talk, we'll come back and talk something about um, Malinobi's distance because it seems to be missing something. So, we'll go to Cook's distance. A general rule of thumb is that observations with a Cook's D of more than three times the mean is a possible outlier. Take a look at the data points below the red line. Now, what Cook's distance does is that it takes the mean of those data points and it tries to compare it to the mean of the outliers and by, by using a simple mathematical equation, which is, is the mean of the data point below the red line, um, sorry, I mean, the mean of the outliers, are they greater than the mean of the data points below the red line, multiplied by three. So the distance actually is the most important thing here. And what this is doing is that it is trying to um, handle the error in Mahalnobi's distance. Mahalnobi's distance is only taking the centroid and is calculating the data point from the centroid. Okay, that seems fine. But how do we know that this is not also an outlier? How do we measure this thing? Is it an effective method? No, it's not an effective method. We need a ratio. And that ratio is what Cook's distance handles. So, and it's telling us that if um, the observations, which is the data points, with a Cook distance D of more than three times the mean U of a possible outlier. So the mean of this outlier or the distance, the mean distance multiplied by three, if it is greater than the mean distance of the main data points, then it is considered as an outlier, else it is not. So I hope um, this basic explanation gets us through. If you have a question, do not hesitate to drop it in the chat section, the Q and E box rather. Thank you. So we also have to consider the dimensionality reduction, which is another way of um, detecting outliers. And under dimensionality reduction, we have the principal component analysis and the linear discriminant analysis. Those two, um, concepts actually very common, though the most common among them is the PCA, which is the principal component um, analysis, because it's often takes place in a structured data set. So we'll take a look. What does dimensionality reduction do? Basically what it, do, what it does is feature selection. We select a subset of the original feature, feature extraction with derived information from the feature set to create a new feature. Now you can call it feature engineering, of course. You are permitted to do that. So we we'll take a look at these terms one after the other. The principal component analysis is a technique that defines the direction of maximal variance. PCA aims to find the direction of maximal variance in high dimensional data and projects it into a new subspace with equal or fewer dimension than the original. By doing this, outliers are detected and handled. So let's say this is the um, direction of the, um, the data points with 
different dimension or high dimensionality. So what PCA does is that it tries to project it into a new direction. Um, this example may seem somehow it may not get it easy. It may not be easy for you to understand, most especially for the newbies. I let's take a look at another example. Yeah. Okay, we have this. You can see this data point is spread across so many um, um, across two features rather. You have the red data points and the blue data points. And what you see here, if you build a module around this, it will be very difficult for a module to perform well. Or possibly if you are trying to hand, um, use a clustering algorithm like k -means, it may be somehow difficult to do this. But how about we apply PCA? When we apply PCA, the data are not spread across all of these um, directions anymore. It is projected in a new direction, which is easier for our clustering algorithms to handle. And you can see that the data is now spread across, um, if you check this, is between minus two and two. That is exactly what we want. That is what we wanted to do. But when you have this and you see some data points coming below minus four, some green above four, some, you know, it becomes difficult for us to handle. We need to reduce the dimension. The essence of reducing the dimension is for we to be able to have a module that has some um, very good performance. So that is all about PCA. Um, take a look at LDA. That is the linear discriminant analysis. Well, just like um, the cousin principal component analysis, LDA happens to also help us to fight outliers by detecting outliers and also handling of outliers. If you look at this chart, we have LD2, which is um, just a feature, which is a feature that we choose to name LD2. Um, it is difficult for us by looking at it from the vertical axis, it is difficult for us to handle this data. But when we look at it from the um, horizontal axis, which is the LD1, um, you can see that we can divide them into different classes. Okay, what am I trying to explain here? Um, LD attempts to find features of say that maximize class separability. It is just all about separating the class classes. Remember I told you when you have features uh, in a structured data, try to imagine a structured data on your Excel sheet. The vertical um, columns that you have on your Excel sheet are the features. The rows that you have on your Excel sheet are the classes. Now how do we separate those classes? When you have them under different features. That is where linear discriminant analysis helps us. And it's not just helping us to separate those classes. It's actually helping us to detect outliers. That is the number one priority of LDA. So we are going to take a look at the difference between um, principal component analysis and um, linear discriminant analysis. So, the first thing is that PCA is very, very um, useful in supervised learning. And LDA is useful in unsupervised learning. So if you are trying to build maybe a logistic regressor model, um, whatever type of regressor model, but it is a supervised learning, then you have to, the best um, technique to use is the principal component analysis. But if you intend to use k-means, for instance, in clustering, the best to use is what? Linear discriminant analysis. So we take a look at the second one. Um, of course, they have their weakness and their strength. So that's what we are looking at. That's what we are using to differentiate between those two um, techniques. So. PCA is not effective with labeled class of data set, while LDA works with large labeled data sets. For instance, you are building um, an image um, identification model, maybe 
uh, maybe facial recognition model, for instance, all the faces must be labeled. All the images, they must be labeled. Images are structured data, and that is what um, LDA works best with. So you have the labels, so you use LDA. But if you are trying to use PCA to handle a label data set, uh, the, uh, it, it won't even work because whatever you have there is just like, okay, I don't know what you are doing. That's what the model will tell you, if it can speak. So if you have um, a non-label data sets, like um, the ones we have been imagining in our heart, um, those data sets collected in their CSV format, they are not labeled, all you just have are uh, just um, numbers, numbers, numbers from beginning to the end, and features with the um, classes, all of that. Yes, PCA is the best to help you handle um, the dimensionality reduction or to help you handle outliers in the data set. So um, here, the third difference is um, it's used for feature classification, of course. We talked about this earlier, and I think I can also, um, if you remember, we said LDA maximizes class separability. So while LDA happens to handle um, the different classes of data sets for an unstructured data or chemists where you just want to group data sets into different classes, um, PCA uh, happens to um, do something different, which is feature classification. Each column, you just want to identify them. You just want to keep them separate. You want to handle the outliers in each column of the data sets or in, in all the column of the data sets. It doesn't have a problem with that. So by the time you have um, um, divided your data sets into um, um, the response or the target response and the Input before you build your model, you can apply PCA. Of course, if you still don't get it, I think Rishika will talk more about it because when you apply PCA, if you, if you really want to go practical about it, you build a model without applying PCA on the data set, then you build another model and apply PCA on the data set and look at the accuracy, look at the, um, the performance of the model. I think it will give you more idea what we are talking about. So, um, the other method of handling outliers is um, the removal of missing values. Oh, that is what we do when we started newly. We don't want stress. We don't know what is happening. We just don't want problem with our model. We just want the model to perform fine. So the best thing we could do is just, okay, uh, we have missing values. Please remove them, remove them. Thank you. But if you take some studies, um, some research has um, stated that, okay, the best time to remove a missing value or missing value which would definitely result into an outlier in your data set, the best time to remove it is if the missing value is 5% or less than 5% of your entire data set, you can remove them. And um, I pledge to you all, I have been um, a victim, oh, let's say I'm a victim or a convict in this, I have removed data sets um, or missing value from my data sets that are up to 20% um, or 30%. I just remove them, I'm like, okay, let me see my model perform better because that's all I care about for now. And then I realize, okay, um, there's a rule I am ignoring, which is very bad. So I have to um, find a proper way of handling the outliers. I can't just remove them since they are many. So ensure you put this into consideration. Of course, we can also use um, correlation, for instance, Spearman's correlation. It helps us to identify the relationship between the features. So when you see those of low features, um, of low correlation, uh, of course, you have to start thinking of how to handle that data set uh, or the feature itself. Then we also have um, those of low variance. When you're saying low variance, what do you mean? You're talking about the um, data set spread across different, um, um, spread across the dimension, but the relationships are actually low. The, the variance is very low. So you 
people are now thinking, or, or those of high variance, you are trying to say, okay, how do I manage it? How do I contain this? Do, do I reduce their dimension? Do I remove the data sets itself? Do I remove those of low variance or high variance? What do I do? How do I ensure that I move the data set from one um, dimension to an entirely new dimension where the variance is actually reduced? So um, those are the things you have to take consideration about while handling outliers. But then the method we discussed earlier are actually very important and then um, followed by the missing value and the high correlation. If you are highly um, experienced in handling outliers, you can go with low variance. If you're not, I think you should stick to the other methods, just a personal opinion to you. So we'll take a look at um, a recap about this before we hand over to Rashika, who will take us further. Um, we have discussed what outliers are, and I believe at this stage, you know what outliers are. They are not difficult for anyone to understand now. Of course, if I meet you on the way and I ask you what is an outlier, you will definitely tell me more than I think I know, I believe. Um, the type of outliers, of course, we've looked at univariate, multivariate, point of global, collective outliers, and contextual. Um, the causes of outliers, of course, mostly it is error. And um, we have taken a look at that and the impact of outliers and how do we detect and fix outliers. We have two major ways, which is the multivariate and the dimensionality reduction. So we then have um, take a little bit of time to discuss other ways of handling outliers, which is missing value, high correlation and the rest. And um, to close it, I will still take a little about the missing value. Uh, sometimes you can fill your missing value with mean, the mean of um, the available values. You can use it to fill the missing values. You can use the mode to fill the missing values. And you can also use the, um, um, the median to fill the missing value. But it's left for you to decide. It depends on the data sets that you have. So you have to be very careful how you do that. So um, at this stage, I will be handling over to Rishika. Um, before then, you also have to understand that um, we have some useful link where you can do more, you can study more and practice with some data sets. And of course we have um, assignments. So Rishika will be taking you from here. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Joseph. Um, so I think before jumping into the collab notebook, we'll just take a few minutes break um, just for people to get up and grab some water, coffee, whatever um, you drink of choice. And then um, we'll jump back and uh, start off with collab. So I guess um, at around, I'm in Pacific time zone, so maybe around 1.14 we'll uh, head back and get started on some coding.
All right, so we'll get started in just a minute. Um, let me, uh, so you can, um, I'm sharing my screen right now. Um, this is on the slides. Um, the link has been provided in the chat. Um, this is a link to the code, which is our CoLab notebook. Um, the direct link has also just been shared in the chat as well. Um, this is where we'll be doing all of our coding. So I'm just going to um, give it another 30 seconds and then we'll um, get started on the coding portion. Okay, so that's our five minute break. Um, so thank you so much, Joseph. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful session. And uh, now we get to the second half uh, where we get to implement. And what we'll be implementing today specifically is PCA and LDA on a data set that I've chosen. Um, so if you navigate to this link, it will take you to um, this notebook here. Um, and we would like to open this notebook in Google Colab. So the way we do that is just navigate to um, any you know browser that you're in, and you can just uh, Google Colab. And when you search for that, it should come to this screen. Um, and now we will uh, navigate to the GitHub tab that's up here. Um, and what we'll do from there is actually copy this link itself. Um, so let me just copy that directly. Um, I'm actually going to copy this link. Um, so if you just navigate to the general women who code data science, this link right here, you can just paste that directly. And here it will just recognize this GitHub URL. And so now we will be able to see all of our notebooks here and today we'll be doing the intro to advanced machine learning three for outlier detection so just click on that and you should be able to come to the screen now so hopefully everyone is at this screen um and yeah if, if anyone's having any trouble please uh, please let me know um you can put a thumbs up in the chat if um if you've uh, been able to load in the notebook properly. If not, then um, I can help you troubleshoot that. So now that we heard, we're here in the notebook, um, before I get started, just our agenda. So we're going to first load in our data set and do some um, simple data information and dis uh, description. And then we'll do our principal component analysis and then linear discriminant analysis. So the data set I've chosen is something that can be found on this, um, the UCI, UCI machine learning repository, which has several uh, different data sets. Um, and the one I've chosen is actually this IRIS data set, which maybe some of you have worked with before. Um, so this is kind of the main website um, for the data set itself, it has some relevant papers, it has some information of what exactly is in the data set, as well as just some general information. Um, and so navigating back to the notebook, uh, the actual data set that we would that we um, will be using is if you go here next to download, click on data folder, and you'll be downloading this one specifically called iris.data. So if you just click on that, then it should automatically download into uh, you know from your browser. Um, and what I want you to do is from there. Um, uh, there's actually some steps in the notebook itself um, if you want to follow along there as well. But basically, once we download iris.data, then it should um, unzip and um, it helps. What I generally do is save it in a location that I can easily retrieve. So I've just saved it here in my desktop um, so that when I want to load it into my Colab notebook, um, it'll be uh, you know, a bit easier to, to find it. You can also do it in documents anything um, that you remember so that you can go back and find it. So now we'll actually go ahead and load in the data. 
So what you can do is um, click this button right here, which has an, uh, a little file icon with an arrow pointing up. And then you'll go to where you've saved the data that we just downloaded and then click on it and then press open. And just click OK for that. That's basically saying that when you stop the runtime of the notebook, the file will actually get deleted. Um, but that's totally fine. That's normal behavior. Um, so as you can see, it's been successfully um, uploaded. And so now we can uh, go ahead and start working with our data set. Um, so I don't see. Um, hopefully everyone is able to get to the point I've come to now. Um, so now uh, let's let's get started. So um, PWD is a very common command that we can use and this to help just basically checks uh, which folder are we actually in in the notebook. So if you want to just run this cell, just press the play button. Um, or you can press um, shift uh, command enter or control enter depending on if you're on a Mac or a Windows system. As you can see, we're in this general folder con called content. And then if we actually do LS, which is basically lists everything in that content folder. As you can see on the left here, we have sample data and iris.data. So we're in the right directory. Um, and so now we actually want to go into um, uh, go and actually load our um, iris.data. So before we're doing that, we do have to import pandas since that's a very important um, library um, and it basically will something that we'll be using quite often throughout the entire uh, notebook. And then so now we have pandas imported, we can load in our data set um, using the dot, uh, dot read underscore CSV. And then here is the file location. So as you saw, we're in content slash iris.data. And then here, I'm just defining the different names for all the columns. Um, and so that's just something that helps so that we know exactly what every column is referring to. So let's go ahead and run that cell. So now it's been loaded in. And then if we run this cell right here, we will see that, okay, we now have um, our data loaded in. This is all the different columns that we just defined up here. And I also have a little statement here that basically tells us how many rows and how many columns we have. So we basically have 150 rows, meaning 150 different um, you know, values, and then five columns corresponding to these five columns that are right here. So these four values, the sepal length and width and the petal length and width are sort of our input variables. And then our target is basically the type of iris um, sort of classification that we want to eventually uh, predict and classify as. Um, so before we jump into actually doing the PCA and LDA, um, I'm going to go ahead and do some description and some more information on the data set. Um, so for, to begin with, we can do iris.info. So if we run this cell here, you can see that it tells us we have 150 entries. Um, this shows us the number of columns that we have. It also tells us how many non-null non values we have. So we actually want to have, um, you know, uh, if it said zero non-null, that's pretty bad because that means that we have several null values. Um, so it's good that every single value for all the different columns are all non-null, meaning we don't have to worry about any missing data points. And we can also see that we have the data type as well. So you can see these are all float values. And then for the target, it's an object because it's just um, defined um, like that and it's not a numerical value. Um, and then we can just do some quick exploratory data analysis. Um, this is something that basically helps to get some more information on our data. So here we're going to be using matplotlib, which is a very nice and friendly library. This will help to show um, just, you know, some more information, just, you know, some nice visual visualization. So here what I've plotted is the three different possible target values. So the three different iris values, along with the count of each of them. As you can see, this is very nice and balanced data. Out of the 150 possible points, there's 50 for every iris type. So that's good that we have some nice balance in our data. Um, the next few cells are just some more um, plotting. Here we're actually printing out all the different possible values for the sepal length. Um, and then we have all the different values for the sepal width in this uh, cell right here. Um, and then we have all the different values for the petal length. Um, so um, I'm not going to go too much more in detail for all of these, but just want to kind of show you what kind of um, quick and easy EDA we can get from this. Um, so now that we have completed that, we actually do have to do some pre-processing on the data set before we can actually jump into our outlier detection. 
Um, so the first step of pre-processing is to divide the data set into a feature set and then the corresponding labels. Um, and uh, so, sorry, I just had a trouble with my video there for a second. Um, so the first step of pre-processing is to divide the data set into our feature set and then to our corresponding labels. So that basically our feature set is those four uh, columns that I mentioned, the, you know, the two length values and the two width values, and then our label is actually our target. So those, you know, one of those three different iris classifications. So in order to do that, we actually split up um, our data set into X and Y. And so for X, we basically are going to be dropping, um, keeping everything, but we're going to be dropping just the target value. And then for our Y, which is our corresponding label, is just only the target. So that's how we do that. And then from there, we are going to divide our data into a training and a test set. Uh, we're able to do this very nice and easily from um, Scikit-Learn, which actually has a built-in train test split. Um, and here we have specified a test size of 0.2. So that means that 80% of the data will be a training set, and then 20% will be our test set. Um, so that we basically will use our X and Y um, variables that we have already created and then do our further um, train and test split. Um, so now we'll be jumping into um, something that PCA actually requires us to do. So PCA is affected by the scale of the data. So before we can actually go ahead and do our PCA analysis, we have to scale the features. Um, so in order to do this, we will use standard scalar, which is another, um, another uh, sort of uh, package from scikit-learn. Um, and this will help to standardize all of our features in our data set on to this unit scale. Um, and this is uh, generally a requirement for um, optimal, optimal performance of several different machine learning algorithms. Um, so before actually using it, we have to import it. So let's go ahead and import that. Um, and then just to make it easy, I have basically just um, defined the standard scalar as SC, just so that when we continue to use it more, it'll be easier and we don't have to type out standard scalar every single time. Um, and we will actually call the standard scalar on our X train and our X test. So basically our feature set, both the train and the test sets. Um, and then we just do a dot fit um, transform for our train and then a dot transform for our test set. Um, and here's kind of a nice uh, visualization of what our array looked like before and after standardization. So as you can see, this kind of um, puts everything on this nice standard unit scale. And that just makes it easier to work with the data for uh, future analysis. And that's kind of our last step of our pre-processing. So now we can actually jump into the main focus for today, which is for PCA and LDA. Um, and so for PCA, we're actually going to use the built-in library from Scikit-Learn, um, which is the PCA library. Um, and PCA depends upon only the feature set and not the labeled data. Um, that's why this is classified as an unsupervised machine learning technique. And this is um, you know, fairly distinct from a supervised mach machine learning technique. And PCA is actually done in a two-step process. So first, we initialize the PCA class by passing the number of components to the constructor. And then secondly, we will then call the fit and then the transform methods, so two different methods. And this is, and then we pass in the feature set to each of these methods. And we do not um, look at the label data, as I mentioned, because it's an unsupervised technique. Um, and the transform method will help to return the specified number of principal components. Um, so let's, let's get into it. So, here we create a PCA object named PCA. So as you can see, I've called this PCA. Before that, I imported the PCA library from Scikit-Learn. Um, here we actually have not specified the number of components in the constructor, but that's something that I will do um, in, a, in a couple steps. But here we have kind of just left it as is. We have not specified that number. And that means that all four of the features in the feature set, so the two different length values and the two different width values, both of them will be returned for both the training and the test set. Um, so as you can see, for X train and X test, I will call the dot fit transform and then the dot transform using the PCA library. So let's go ahead and run that. 
And then from there, one more thing we can do is explained variance. And explained variance helps to tell you exactly how much information or variance in this, in this case can actually be attributed to each of the principal components. Um, and this is important because um, since we're sort of converting from this four dimensional space to a two dimensional space, in this you actually can lose some of the variance or the information um, when you're doing this conversion. So the way we calculate this is simply um, on our PSA object that we have declared, you call the, the dot explained underscore variance underscore ratio underscore. Um, and what we get as an output is this array. And the way that we can actually interpret this is we can see that the first principal component contains 72.22% of the variance. And the second principal component contains 23.97% of the variance. So together, both of these components contain 95.8% of the information, which is a very nice and high value. So that's, that's really good news. Um, so given that, that's something that, since I didn't specify the number of components in the constructor, um, we can uh, try to calculate this explained variance ratio and see what the numbers are like, and that will help us to inform what is the proper number of components to specify in the constructor itself. Um, and so now, just quickly, I'm going to specify the number of components as n components equals one. Um, and we're repeating the same exact process from earlier, where we do the, we call the fit transform and the transform on the x train and the x test. But here we're just specifying the number of components to be one. Um, and then on this, we're going to now train and make predictions and then actually look at our evaluation using, uh, using a confusion matrix. Um, so to train and make the predictions, we're actually going to be using the random forest classifier, which is a fairly common classifier that's used. Again, that is from scikit-learn. Um, so I will now uh, declare this classifier object and then call random forest classifier. And here I've defined the max depth to be two and the random state to be zero. These are typically the default values that are chosen. And then I will call the dot fit since we're doing our training. And we do that on our X train and our Y train. So after completing the training, then we go ahead and make our predictions. So this is where I create a new object called Y predict. And this is where we actually do our predictions on our X test. Um, so this is why we do our train test split because we do our, all of our training on 80% of the data and then we test it out on the remaining 20% of our data. So let's call that. Um, and then our last step here is to do our evaluation to see, you know, uh, how well did we do our training and our predictions. Um, so to do that, I'm going to import the confusion matrix and the accuracy score again from scikit-learn, um, specifically from the metrics in scikit-learn. And here um, I'm just going to be creating a, a confusion matrix and the inputs to that are Y test and Y prediction, because that's the two values that we're comparing for a confusion matrix. Then to print out our accuracy score, again, we will be comparing our Y tests and our Y prediction. Um, so let's go ahead and run that. And as you can see here, um, our random forest algorithm or the random forest classifier from Cycler is actually able to do pretty well. We predicted 28 out of 30 instances, and this is why we result in a 93.33% accuracy. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, you know, generally anything in that range is uh, very, very good accuracy. So um, that's, that's good news that we're able to get some good classification going. Um, so that concludes everything for PCA. Um, and now I'll move to the second half, which is LDA. Um, so for this, we'll actually be using um, um, NumPy as well a little bit later. So I'm just going to import that here. Um, it's another very useful um, library. And here we actually have to do uh, one more step of pre-processing. And here we actually have to divide, again, divide the data set into features and corresponding labels. And then we divide the resulting data set from that into the training and the test set. So it's kind of repeating the same process uh, where we do our train test split. Um, so here what we're doing is uh, we're actually assigning the first four columns of the data set. Um, also known as the feature set to the X variable here, um, while the values in the fifth column or the labels are assigned to the Y, uh, to the y variable. So kind of repeating the same, same exact thing. This is a slightly different way of doing it. Um, and then again, we divide the data into training and test set. Um, we have another 
80-20 split. So 80% of the data is going into the training portion, and then 20% of the data is going to the test portion, um, sort of uh, repeating the same pre-processing steps as we did for, um, for PCA. And then again, we do the same sort of feature scaling using the uh, standard scaler um, as we already did for PCA, and let's do that again. Um, so here's a bit more information on what we're going, going to be doing for LDA. So again, we'll be using scikit-learn. Um, and here we'll actually be using the linear discriminant analysis um, class of um, scikit-learn. And this is how we will achieve um, our analysis. And for this, we have to pass in the value for the n components parameter. Similarly, we did for PCA. And this basically refers to the number of linear discriminants that we want to retrieve. Um, and so in this case, particularly, I've set the end components to be one. And this is because we want to check the performance of our classifier with a single uh, linear discriminant. Um, that value can be, can be changed um, however you would like. And then from there, we will again, will execute the fit method and the transform method to actually retrieve our linear discriminants. Um, and in the case of LDA, the transform method actually takes two parameters. We have the X train and the Y train. Um, however, in the case of PCA, the transform method only required one parameter, if you, if you recall, and that was only um, the X train and not the Y train as well. So this um, shows that LDA takes the output, output class labels into account while selecting the linear discriminants, while PCA does not depend on the output labels at all. So that's one very important distinction between PCA and LDA. Um, so just like we did with PCA, we're going to import this linear discriminant analysis class. We're going to declare our LDA object, and here we've specified the number of components to be one. Um, and again, we're calling our fit transform, but here we're doing on the X train and the Y train. For PCA, we did it only on the X train. And then we're going to call the dot transform on our X test. So let's go ahead and run that. And just like we did for PCA, we're going to be training and making predictions as well as um, doing some evaluation. So um, here we have, uh, we're again importing the random forest classifier, um, the same sort of parameters for the max depth and the random state. And here we're going to be first fitting our data on the X train and Y train, and then making our predictions by calling the doc predict function on our X test. Um, and then to end with, we will again do our evaluation. Again, we're going to be printing out a confusion matrix along with the accuracy score. So here um, we're printing out the confusion matrix, calling it on Y test and Y predict, just like we did for PCA, and then calculating our accuracy score. Um, so here we see our accuracy is 1.0. Um, this is obviously very um, unlikely. And the reason why it's doing so well is because not only does our um, data set not have any missing values, but it's also very well balanced between the three different, um, you know, iris classifications, as we saw when I did the exploratory data analysis, which is highly uncommon for any, you know, real world data sets. Um, that's one reason why this iris data set is so commonly used. It's like, I think the most popular data set on the machine learning repository uh, by UC Irvine. Um, and it's because of how well balanced the data is, how there's no missing values, no null values. Um, that's why it's really nice to use it when you're trying to um, learn about a new kind of machine learning algorithm or get familiar with a new kind of analysis. That's why it's typically used. Um, but, you know, it's very, very uncommon to actually see this sort of uh, perfect accuracy score. Um, so I hope that answers the question in the Q&A. Um, and so that's all I have for the, the coding portion. Um, it was um, pretty, pretty simple. Um, I'll just do a quick review of what I, what I went through before we sort of close this out. Um, but as you saw, we loaded in our data sets. Um, we specified the column values. We saw, okay, so these four columns are our feature set. This is what we're using to train and make our predictions for the target value itself. And as you saw in here, for our three target values are basically our three different iris um, flower classifications. It's perfectly balanced, 50 for each. Um, there's some more exploratory data analysis that we did. And then we um, 
did some pre-processing. So first we uh, sort of separate our data set into the feature set for the four columns, along with the corresponding labels, uh, which is our target value. And then we did a trained test split. We did some pre-processing with the standard scalar. Um, and then we did our PC analysis where we called our um, fit transform on X train only. And then we did our transform on our X test. We got our explained variance value as well as doing some training and predictions using the random forest classifier and we saw our accuracy in our confusion matrix. Um, then we repeated the same sort of um, uh, separation of the data set and we also did our trained test split again. We did our standard scalar um, since this, this, uh, this feature scaling is actually also required for, uh, for LDA. And then um, here we did something slightly different because our dot fit transform was called on our X train and our Y train. Um, and then we got the same sort of output. Uh, we got our uh, training and we made our predictions using the, uh, the same random forest classifier as we did for PCA. And then we got our evaluation um, of our uh, predictions and we saw that it was a perfect accuracy. Um, and just to wrap up, just for some high level comparison between PCA and LDA, what do you want to use for dimensionality rate reduction or for um, you know, a null, uh, outlier detection? So in the case of uniformly distributed data, um, LDA almost always performs better than PCA. And that's something that we actually just saw. Our data was perfectly uniformly distributed. We had 50 for each type. Um, so our accuracy was a perfect uh, you know, 100%, whereas it was 93% for PCA. Um, however, that if the data is highly skewed, meaning it's irregularly distributed, so this is you know, instead of 50 for each type, maybe it was um, you know, uh, you know, the values were slightly changed. Um, in that case, it's actually advised to use PCA, um, and this is because LDA can actually be biased towards the majority class. Um, finally, it's also beneficial that PCA can be applied to labeled and unlabeled data because it does not rely on the output labels. And that's kind of the point I was making where I said PCA is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And um, that's why we don't necessarily need label data because when we're actually calling our um, fit transform, we only use the X train and not the Y train, but LDA does require label data. And so that's why um, if we do have label data and is uniformly distributed, then we want to use LDA in place of PCA. Um, and then here at the end, I just have a few references listed. Um, just some that I used uh, for this code up here, as well as just some further reading um, that I think could be helpful. Um, so that concludes the coding portion. Um, I'm just going to take a quick look at the Q&A. And I see a question about um, the random forest classifier. Um, so um, I, it's kind of the user's decision of what classifier to use. Um, the random forest classifier is a nice general purpose classifier, but if you go into scikit-learn documentation, you can see that there's several other classifiers and each classifier kind of has a, a certain purpose or certain application that it's best suited for. I just chose random forest classifier because it's a very commonly used one. Um, and we had, you know, uh, really nice and friendly data that we that we were working with, so that's why I chose the random forest classifier um, just for this particular case. Um, so that's it for the coding portion. Um, let me just go ahead and see if there's anything else in the Q and A. Um, don't see any more questions here. Um, but I guess to jump back to the, um, the presentation, um, here are uh, three data sets that all work with slightly different data. So we have a letter recognition data set, which is multidimensional. Um, we have the New York Times corpus, which is a collection of various New York Times articles. So this is time series data, and this can help with event detection. And then we have multivariate time series data. And this is provided by Yahoo Labs. And it actually goes over some of their server traffic. So those are just some additional data sets. And perhaps you can um, apply the same kind of code that I had for PCA and LDA and see uh, what you can do with it. Because this kind of data is slightly different, 
then the data I was working with, you might have to do some more pre-processing or you might have to use a different classifier than the random forest classifier. But um, just for some further um, homework. Um, and so thank you everyone for joining for today's session. Um, thank you for, uh, for joining and um, spending a couple hours with us. Um, I've done these sorts of sessions in the past and it's been a, a wonderful experience and I hope all of you um, learned something, learned something new today. Um, we do have three more sessions left for this entire series. Um, so I will actually presenting, be presenting for next week's series. We'll be focusing on text data. Um, so again, same um, time, same day next week. Um, and if you have any questions, please join us on Slack and post your questions to the Help Me channel. And uh, we'll, uh, you know, we would love to answer any questions that you might have. And I guess before I close, if anyone has any closing questions, um, feel free to drop that in the Q&A box. Um, otherwise, I think that's it for the content for today's session. Right. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A box. Um, so I guess um, we'll conclude. Um, I see a question, which other classifiers should we learn about? Um, I can't list like all of them off the top of my head, but um, if you were to, let me see if I can go back to the code and uh, find that out. Um, Yeah, so um, this was the random forest classifier was directly imported from this part of scikit-learn. Um, but a, a really simple and easy way to find that out is um, if we were to just type in sklearn classifiers. Um, so it would depend on if you're doing like supervised versus unsupervised learning. And, but this goes over all the various classifiers. Um, some of them are a bit more advanced. Here's a random forest classifier. We also have, you know, K neighbors, we have SVC, we have decision trees, um, we have Gaussian. So there's several different classifiers. Um, I think the best way to sort of understand all of them is to read the documentation on each of them, as well as just try and get out yourself. And a lot of these, um, a lot of the doc documentation contains sample code um, that you can use. Um, and that helps to sort of understand exactly what is going on. Um, let's see. So what about N estimators? So I did not change that value. Um, but N estimators is basically the number of trees that we have in the forest. So that is what um, is defined. And the default value for that is 100. Typically, that's not something that you change. I would say the only thing you really change is like max depth or max features. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can change here. Um, I chose to keep it pretty simple, but you know that's something you can kind of play around and see what exactly you can do. Um, some other outlier detections. Um, so more than LDA and PCA, I believe um, that's kind of the most um, standard ones that we have. Those are the most popular ones for both supervised and unsupervised learning. So I think that's um, kind of a good place to start. Um, but you can do a simple Google search and see what other kind of outlier detection methods they are. But I think it's a nice place to start off um, since it covers both supervised and unsupervised learning. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. Thank you everyone again for joining. Um, have a great rest of your weekend and we hope to see you all next week. Thank you.